So uh, today we're going to talk about a holistic approach to breathing and respiratory problems. My name is Mary Bourne. I'm a traditional naturopath. I love sharing natural remedies with people. And this class is a lengthy class because it really is a tutorial. It's a um, class that's not only going to talk about some breathing, it's going to talk about the respiratory system, how it works, and how you can make it more efficient and support it. So you can reach me at Mary at bornforhealth.com and my website is bornforhealth.com. So today, um, let's, I'm going to take me off of the screen and then go ahead with the next slide, I think. There we go. So breath equals life. From the first breath we take until our last, we need a consistent, constant supply of oxygen to live. To breathe is to live and life requires freedom. Hence the phrase, breathing free. And this picture really depicts how important it is to connect with the air around us and our ability to feel free is in direct proportion to how free we can breathe. When afraid, we hold our breath. But what happens when we can't breathe free? What happens when our breathing is stifled, stuffy, congested, and difficult? It's hard to feel good when you can't freely take in the breath of life. If you've ever been challenged with not being able to take a breath, it's pretty scary. So let's go over what makes up the respiratory system and our breath. So we take in air in our nose, uh, which is considered the nasal cavity, or by way of the mouth. Now, when we do it through the nasal cavity, there are little hairs and um, like a mu thin mucus that will trap bacteria and microbes that shouldn't go down the, into the lungs. When we breathe through our mouth, then there isn't that protection and there is some saliva in the mouth, but it dries out quickly. And so people who are mouth breathers are going to need more water. They're going to have to lubricate their mouth more frequently. Now, once it bypasses, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, airways, so to speak, the nose and the mouth, then it goes down into um, the pharynx now or the throat. And at the back of this area here, it, this divides into two. So behind this tube here is where the food goes. And this flap called the epiglottis stops the food and liquid from going down into the trachea. So we have the epiglottis, we have the larynx, which is often called the voice box, and then we have the trachea. Now you can see these bands, uh, almost uh, like uh, uh, it's cartilage that can constrict and release to allow the airflow into the lung area. Over here we have the pleura, and the pleura is um, a very thin section that divides, uh, and it can become inflamed. This actually slides back and forth as we breathe, and if you've ever had pleurisy, you know that every breath in and out is very painful. Now, when we, um, now recently, to getting back into the, the larynx and that, recently I viewed a video, 
It was done by Peggy Hall in California, who interviewed the family of Shari, C-H-A-R-I, and there's Mama Shari and Deepak Shari and Dr. Shari. And in this video, Deepak Shari, who is a biofeedback engineer, talked about his method of working with people to strengthen their voice. He has worked with um, singers, all kinds of people, public speakers, and um, I could probably use this help because every once in a while my throat does not perform properly and I have to cough and clear it and whatever. So it's um, not the easiest to deal with, but that's, that's the voice box. And you've often heard of a tracheotomy. That's when the airflow has been obstructed and they put a hole in this area so that air can be forced into the lungs because, well, breath is life. If you don't have breath, you don't have life. So um, let me see my notes. I wanna make sure. So when, uh, when this is divided off, there you can see that there's two tubules over here going into the lungs and, <clears throat> excuse me, those are the bronchioles. They're tiny, so it goes from air to a smaller airways to the very smallest airway, which is called alveoli. And this is when oxygen mixes with the blood. And it's a, a really intricate system. We have the ribs that protect the lungs um, up to a point. We have the diaphragm, which is the muscle that bellows the lungs so that we can breathe. The lungs don't have a muscle of their own. So they, it depends on the diaphragm to push up and then release down as we breathe. So how do the lungs and respiratory system work? Well, the cells in our bodies need oxygen to stay alive. Carbon dioxide is made in our body as cells do their jobs. The lungs and respiratory system allow oxygen in the air to be taken into the body while also letting the body get rid of carbon dioxide in, when we breathe out. So when you breathe in, the diaphragm moves downward toward the abdomen and the rib muscles pull the ribs upward and outward. This makes the chest cavity bigger and pulls air through the nose or mouth into the lungs. In exhalation, the diaphragm moves upward and the chest wall muscles relax, causing the chest cavity to get smaller and push air out of the respiratory system through the nose or mouth. So every few seconds with each inhalation, air fills a large portion of the millions of alveoli. In a process called diffusion, oxygen moves from the alveoli to the blood through the capillaries, which are tiny blood vessels lining the alveoli walls. And once in the bloodstream, oxygen gets picked up by hemoglobin in red blood cells. This oxygen rich blood then flows back to the heart, which pumps it through the arteries to oxygen hungry tissues throughout the body. Now, one of the systems that needs a great amount of oxygen is the brain. And when we deprive the body of a good supply of oxygen, the brain suffers. So in the tiny capillaries of the body tissues, oxygen is freed from the hemoglobin and moves into the cells. So 
carbon dioxide made by the cells as they do their work moves out of the cells into the capillaries where most of it dissolves in the plasma of the blood. Blood rich in carbon dioxide then returns to the heart by way of the veins. Now, that's why when you hit a vein, it's not as big a deal as when you hit an artery because the artery is pumping and you can lose so much blood that way. So from the heart, this blood is pumped to the lungs where carbon dioxide passes into the alveole to be exhaled. We need to get rid of carbon dioxide. We do not want to breathe this back in. So knowing all this, how then does wearing a face covering affect our ability to obtain good oxygen? Well, common sense would tell you that wearing anything over your nose and our mouth will affect breathing. And it is worse for some than others. In all instances, a person should have the freedom to choose what they deem important, given they have all the information to make that decision. Now, I consider myself a mature adult. I do not need a mommy or a daddy telling me what to do. I have gone past that some 60 years ago. And it infuriates me that people who have no knowledge of health and how the body works will dogmate, dictate, and mandate all the things that are counterintuitive to health. So, and does it do the job? So what are the negative effects of mask wearing? You know, in health and in when you decide uh, a protocol, you should take all of the ramifications into consideration. You need to look at the risk factors and none of that has been taken into consideration. They are blinded by the fact that you are retaking in that carbon dioxide, that you're spreading bacteria all over your face, that children have saliva and mucus rubbed all over their face all the time. This, and what if you have a, a concern with hearing, like I do? I'm a lip reader. It aids in my ability to hear. What if you're claustrophobic? What if you have asthma? None of this is taken into consideration. And what they're doing, like Costco, has now eliminated the <clears throat> medical, um, if you have a medical concern that you can be uh, excused from wearing a mask. Oh no, they're not even considering that anymore. So some people are so up in arms, they're tearing up their, ripping, cutting up their cards and sending it back to Costco. Because this is um, against our freedom. Uh, these steps are considered to me a, an, an infringement of our natural freedom given to us by God, not by the government. The government is protected and these are freedoms given to us by God. So <clears throat> let's talk about mucus. Mucus is a thin, slippery secretion that coats mucous membranes. We have mucous membranes all over our body. It's composed primarily of water with glycoproteins to thicken it and make it slippery. And now this sounds gross, but it's necessary. What this mucus does is it traps microbes. So it contains inorganic salts, antiseptic enzymes. So not only does it trap these microbes, it can gobble them up. It can 
notify the immune system that it needs further attack. Some of these compounds are part of the body's infection fighting system. So mucus flushes irritants from the membranes. That's why we blow our nose, we sneeze, our eyes water. This is all part of that. So if you look at a tongue and you want to examine what's normal mucus, it's thin, clear, and is a light coating. Clear, watery, abundant, early stages of a cold or other respiratory irritation means that it's profuse because the immune system is trying to flush toxins. This is also very acidic. So if it's dripping, our nose will be irritated and red. A lot of people think it's from the tissues, but it's actually the acid from the saliva and the mucus um, gets very acid to fight infection. Now, if it's white, this is a later stage of cold or irritation. And in TCM, it's called cold phlegm. If it's yellow, this is a more involved sign of infection. And it's typically a viral infection. So we've moved, it's no longer considered a bacterial, it's now considered viral. If it's green, it contains neutrophils. This is pus. <laughs> and it's a more serious infection. And this may be bacterial, but it can sometimes be viral. So if it's red or pink, there's a sign of bleeding. So it could be the gums, it could be um, other things. But if it isn't the gums, it definitely needs checking out. And if it's deficient, that means the tissue is dehydrated could be because you're a smoker that dehydrates it. You're not a good water drinker. That could be because it's dry. Or you could be dealing with some medication from, uh, that you're taking for a chronic problem. And now there's something called mask mouth. Now, you know, the dentists have been dealing with what they call meth mouth. And these are from people who are using drugs but now that dentistry has opened up again and they're back to work, they're finding that people, because of so much bacteria and instead of breathing through their nose while wearing a mask, they're breathing through their mouth. And this is causing dry mouth, which leads to a decrease in saliva and the saliva is what fights bacteria and it actually cleanses the teeth. Now I've left a link here and I'll put that link in the description below if you're viewing this on YouTube. So mask wearing is causing some real problems with bad breath, recessed gums, and dental cavities. So uh, Again, all of the risks have not been considered. So <clears throat> some specific respiratory issues, allergic reactions, mast cells are hypersensitized and chronic inflammation sets in due to toxicity and constant irritation. When this happens, people will often take an antihistamine it fixes the symptom, but not the problem. You really need to find out what exactly is causing this allergic reaction. Often doing a food diary will help uh, identify. Uh, you can uh, write some foods down that you've eaten. And if after a certain food, you realize, wow, my, um, allergic responses are increasing after this particular food, then you stop the food for a couple of weeks, start the food and see if you get the same reaction and voila, you know, you're allergic to that particular food. And 
you need to address fixing the problem, which is generally working on the gut. <laughs> so asthma is a more serious allergic response. Uh, mucus or constriction in the bronchial passages make uh, breathing difficult. And oftentimes people will be put on inhalers and, and medications and those cause a whole host of problems. So uh, there's often an emotional component to asthma and that also not only do you want to do a food diary, but you want to do what's happening around the time that you're having difficulty breathing. And um, then there's bronchitis, which is inflammation of the bronchial passage. It can be Anytime you see I, I, itis at the end of a word, it means inflammation. But it can also be caused by uh, irritation. <clears throat> now, pneumonia can be either viral or it can be bacterial. But it's an infection in the lungs resulting in fluid retention in the lung. So the fluid builds up and your lungs aren't efficient in getting the fluids out. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the emotional components of these. Pleurisy, I talked a little bit about that when explaining the respiratory system. So uh, this is the inflammation of the pleura, which is lining of the lungs, which results in not just labor breathing, but intense pain. I had it one time when I was in my 20s. And the only way I could take a deep breath was if my husband wrapped his arms around me from behind and just held me extremely tight. And you can get like um, a brace that holds your ribs in and stops the um, chafing that occurs in pleurisy. So it's really important. I have some wonderful herbs to talk about later that helps with these conditions. So, and then we have emphysema, which is damage. This is fourth degree tissue, chronic um, cellular death, uh, and then often it's from smoking or like asbestos or other irritants that result in breaking down of lung tissue. It actually can be, swimmers can get this later on in life from breathing in oxygen or not oxygen, chlorine from a swimming pool. Um, chlorine can be very damaging for the lungs. So now this is the respiratory terrain, the irritation, <clears throat> uh, copious water, watery mucus, acute cough in the initial stages of infection, allergy or exposure to irritants. Now, you don't want to take an antihistamine. What you want to do is assist the immune system with, like, my favorite is elderberry, but Wild cherry bark is good, eye bright, lemon, uh, you know, like um, if you do uh, fresh lemon in a little bit of water with some honey, that can be very helpful. There's a wonderful ginger lemon tea that um, you can get. Now, the opposite of that is depression or mucus stops moving and the sinuses or lungs become chronically congested and you get this non-productive cough. So making more fluid can benefit this situation. Um, camphor, eucalyptus, we have something we call taifu and that's a fabulous blend that um, assists with uh, you could breathe this in. If you've ever uh, taken a little bit of horseradish that really loosens everything up, 
Uh, Pinemark essential oil is a really good one to diffuse um, thyme herb, taking it internally or doing thyme essential oil can also benefit the uh, non-productive cough. So then we have the chronic respiratory terrain and that's when we have stagnation where we have thickening of mucus and the mucus becomes congested and more difficult to expel. You have chronic uh, irritation in the sinuses, you have pneumonia, some cases of asthma, and the herbs that have been known to help that are elecum pain, eucalyptus essential oil, golden seal. Now, I usually shy away from golden seal unless it's the last resort type of thing because it takes five years for a golden seal root to develop and they've been really over harvested and um, there are some um, areas that are growing it purposefully but wild harvesting of golden seal is really look frowned upon. Uh, whorehound pine uh, essential oil thyme or we have a lovely breathe free essential oil blend that I've been using. Um, it, I usually put oh, about a dime's worth of uh, aloe vera in my hand and I'll put some of the breathe free essential oil and rub it. And then I'll rub my chest and up into my throat area before I go to bed at night. And this really stops me from coughing. It's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and it smells beautiful. Now, atrophy is when the lung tissue becomes damaged. And, um, you know, in all the other things we talked about, the cells can be repaired. But when there's atrophy, the dead cells need to be gotten rid of. You need to build new cells. And um, sometimes the cellular damage is to the point where even building new cells has, um, you can't go back to being 20 again. So astragalus is a fabulous herb if you're dealing with difficulty breathing, chronic dry cough, COPD. Um, take two astragalus three times a day. Cordyceps is also, now these two, Astragalus and cordyceps are considered food grade. In other words, cordyceps is simply a mushroom. And these, uh, and astragalus is a very nutritive uh, bark, like inner bark. And um, they're great for older people. So these are things that are food and they can be taken every single day. And then there's licorice now. Some medications interact with licorice and, and there's been difficulty with that. But um, marshmallow is a very mucilant. Mullen, mullen is a great herb. Pleurisy root and then again the breathe free essential oil. Now we have acute respiratory terrain. This is constriction and spasms in the respiratory passages due to chronic cough or irritation as found in croup, whooping cough, and some cases of asthma. So um, clary sage essential oil if you're an adult. Lobelia if you're a child can be rubbed on the chest to help uh, get into the, the deep tissues of the, the respiratory. Um, also, you can put a few drops in, in some warm water and have the child sip on it. Pleurisy root, skunk cabbage, and thyme essential oil. Now, there's several different kinds of thyme and you want sweet thyme. Uh, relaxation, that's when there's, so it's the opposite of constriction. Relaxation happens. Um, there's bleeding, there's chronic drippery, drip secretions. And some people, when it's in the nasal cavity, will snuff bayberry. So they'll sniff it up and 
take it in and because it's such an astringent will um, shrink those relaxed um, mast cells. And then uh, horsetail. Horsetail is full, full of min minerals and with children, it may be the fact that um, they are mineral deficient because their digestive system, excuse me, is too weak. Let me take some water here. So we're going to talk about, this is a traditional Chinese medicine information. And they associate grief with what they call the metal element. You know, you have fire and you have air and you have all the, and the um, and wind is air and you have um, the metal. So the metal element represents the body's defense. So, you know, it's like the shield um, ability or, so the respiratory is a part of the immune system. Now, I believe that the immune system is multifaceted. So the respiratory is part of it. The skin is part of it. So the liver is part of it. So the immune system is, includes a lot of different aspects or systems of the body. So a person is more prone to congestion, colds, influenza, and pneumonia when they're grieving. We, we know that the grieving process lowers our resistance. So grief can also increase the risk of immune disorders such as cancer, lymphoma, leukemia, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Now, a lot of times this is long-term grieving. You know, it could be childhood grief. It could be a trauma that you went through and you've never gotten over. Or it could be the death of a loved one. There's such a thing as grieving to death. According to an article in U.S. News, the widowhood effect is the increased likelihood for a recently widowed person to die has been well studied. Previous studies have shown that mortality increases anywhere from 40 to 90 percent in the three months following the death of a spouse and lingers at 15 percent during the months after. And I will link that. Uh, source in the description below for those watching it on um, recorded YouTube. So breathing and freedom. Breath is associated with life and liberty. When we feel overly controlled, we feel stifled or smothered. Breathing freely. I need room to breathe. Give me space to breathe. Um, these are all things we say without thinking it out, but they are associated with breathing. So the diaphragm, now this is the muscle that we were talking about when I was showing you how the immune, um, how the respiratory system works. Breathing in through the nose and down, pushes the diaphragm down, and then the, we, the air pushes the diaphragm up and out and and that's the way that flows. So a great exercise to do is to lie on your back, place one hand on your stomach and the other hand um, on your chest, just kind of upper chest. And just lay there for a minute and breathe and find out what is moving. If your chest is moving, it could be that you have a hiatal hernia or that you just really don't practice what they call diaphragm breathing. And you should uh, start doing that exercise breathing by pushing your belly out and in and out and in and exercise that diaphragm so that you're breathing better from the center of your body. When you breathe from the top of the chest, that can force anxiety. It can contribute to a panic attack. 
So you really need to focus when you're breathing and you're feeling like anxious and concerned and you're finding yourself breathing quickly, slow your breathing down and start breathing from the abdomen. So, uh, and if you feel that there is congestion there, then you can um, see a chiropractor or somebody who is first in helping you get that, get rid of that hiatal hernia. Um, the medical view on that is that they will do it. They will um, create an operation, but that operation really is like 90% successful or not 90% unsuccessful because it's something you're doing that's creating that problem. It's your thinking uh, that creates that. So the interesting fact about breathing is the diaphragm is under both conscious and unconscious control. So you can be breathing along or not breathing and you're doing it without thinking. But you can control it by thinking. I think that's pretty fascinating. So we can breathe automatically or we can breathe through thought. And often conscious breathing is the foundation of meditation, such as yoga. It's all about the breath and aids in self-awareness and healing. So getting centered is actually part of working with what we call the core or the, the breathing pattern is part of strengthening that core. So you want to take stock of how you're breathing. If you're sitting up straight, you should feel your uh, stomach move in and out and not your upper chest. So sitting is another way that you can evaluate uh, how you're breathing. Uh, if you're stopped at a red light, you can examine your breathing. Um, so, and then be aware that maybe it is a, hiatal hernia. So breathing and emotions, to breathe is to feel, stifling one's breath is a way of stifling one's emotions. Every emotion has its own breathing pattern. And I'm not going to go into all the patterns that um, contribute to emotions but you can shift your emotions by shifting your breathing pattern. So if you're anxious or you're depressed, try breathing differently. So deep breathing promotes self-awareness and um, is an essential part of breathing. So possible emotion, uh, emotional connections is the lung congestion and pneumonia, grieving, feeling smothered, loss of feeling fully alive, and unable to be free. So you feel there is something holding you back. It may be financial, it may be um, relationship, lack of relationship, whatever. There's something that you're missing. And um, when you find that out, when you get in touch with that, you can breathe through it and then figure out what action steps you can take to, to uh, remove this. I will talk about some um, emotional healing essences in a little bit, which really help to facilitate moving these stuck emotions. When you have a constricted feeling in the chest, deep-seated grief, sadness, and pain um, that has been suppressed, you need help in moving that along sometimes therapy of some sort uh, to help move it along. Post-nasal drip is what we consider internal crying. It's suppressed expression of grief. Um, so it can be a physical manifestation, but it can also be an emotional one, and it can be both. Now, coughing, you need to get something off your chest. So if you're coughing a lot, Think about what it is that you're not being able to express or that you're not saying. And asthma, feeling smothered, 
unable to breathe freely. This is something that disturbs me greatly that we in the last nine months have not been able to be compassionate with each other, look each other in the eyes and see fully the face of compassion in front of us. Grieving involves convulsive sobbing, wailing, and even screaming, not just crying with your tears. It can be, it's uh, diaphragmatic. You have to use the diaphragm when actually grieving because in this you are actually emptying out and nature abhors a vacuum so when you empty out you can't do anything but take a deep breath in and when you take that deep breath in consider courage consider your next step so we have to allow ourselves to empty out and to have somebody there that we can hug and and feel bonding and caring is invaluable. It's something I hope we never lose and that we don't let others stop us from attaining this. So if you can't hug a human, hug a cow. <laughs> I had to laugh when I saw this picture. It's like, oh my goodness, we are so hug deprived that people are out donning overalls, hugging cows. So I thought throwing a laugh in there would be good. So a breathing exercise of letting go. Sit up or lay on your back, inhale deeply through your nose, Hold your breath for just a second. Exhale deeply through your mouth. Try to force as much air out of your lungs as you possibly can. As you suck in your stomach and push upwards with your diaphragm and then inhale. So it's pretty much a squared breath. You're counting the each phase of uh, breathing. So. Uh, inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Rest, two, three, four. That type of thing. So um, here is another one for awareness. So it can be done sitting or lying down. Now, this is really good to take stock. Where is the pain? Where? Do I feel discomfort? So it can be done sitting or lying, um, or it could be what's bothering me. You know, it doesn't have to be pain. It could be what's bothering me. So start breathing slowly and deeply, counting your breath if you like. When you are breathing slowly and deeply, focus intently on your breathing to the point that no words are flowing through your brain. And that's kind of hard. A lot of people just chatter, chatter, chatter. And if you find yourself chattering like that, passion flower herb is a really good one to take that sort of quiets the brain. So your entire mind is focused on your breath. Expand this awareness to notice your entire body in the same way. So you start maybe with your feet and start moving up. Do I feel pain? in my ankles, in my shins, in my knees. And, and then when there is pain, then focus on that area, take a few deep breaths, and then move on. And then pretty soon you've up to your brain and that you quiet your brain and give good energy to your brain and you're done. So it's a great um, way of meditating. Um, some people will say, I am relaxed. I am relaxed. And I love this picture of this tree because it looks so much like, um, like a pair of lungs. <laughs> so well, let's go into some herbs that are known to support the respiratory system. So bitter orange has been used to replace ephedra now. The FDA took um, 
Chinese ephedra away from us. Ephedra has actually grown wild in like places like Utah. Uh, and they made a tea out of it. Now it was slightly stimulant, but it was great for the sinuses and opening up congestion. And But we have replaced it with bitter orange and it contain, contains synephrine, uh, which is a mimic of epinephrine. It may help open passage, air passages to ease breathing. It's cooling and drying expectorant for excessive mucus in allergic reactions and productive coughs. So bitter orange is the source of neroli and bergamot. I absolutely love bergamot essential oil. Neroli is a little pricey, but bergamot is um, fairly inexpensive and it uh, has that little bit of citrusy smell to it. Now, all citrus essential oils um, use with caution in the summertime because if you're out in the sun, it can make you more photosensitive. So um, it can make you sunburn more easily. But in the wintertime, they are fabulous because they make you more sensitive to the sun. And people dealing with SAD um, and depression during the wintertime, these citrus, diffusing these citrus oils can be very, very helpful. So these are the flower essences I mentioned. Now the first one is called open heart and it may assist with the ability to love. So a lot of times we just close our hearts off and we'll never let that happen again. Um, and so you control not only your breathing, but your ability to be open and free and somewhat vulnerable, which if you aren't, you lose out on a lot of um, <laughs> love. So, so it can increase empathy and compassion. And this is uh, something you take orally, comes in a dropper bottle and you just squirt the whole dropper um, underneath your mouth and uh, underneath your tongue rather and um, hold it for a second and swallow. And you can follow it with water. Now it has a glycerin base, so it's okay for children, um, but and recovering alcoholics. But for some people, it's quite sweet. And what they'll do is um, mix it in water, and that's okay too. You can put it in your water bottle and sip on it throughout the day. You can put it in a bath and soak in it. Um, it's really. It's an energetic medicine. And another one is release it. And this may assist the body with grieving processes. So if you're having difficulty letting go of something, you're just hanging on and hanging on, and you realize you need to move on, that um, it really is holding you back, this um, inability to grieve properly. So, you um you want to let it go as the song says and release it can help you do that so elecampane is a great herb it's warming drying remedy for chronic bronchial mucus uh, where there is an irritable cough especially in chronic coughs of the elderly excuse me i take some more water So specific for chronic bronchitis, tuberculosis, and asthma. So it helps deep-seated grief. And Dorothy Hall, who is a um, longtime herbalist, says shallow breathers can't breathe from the diaphragm. <coughs> Sigh a lot, they hunch over, they compress their solar plexus area. So if you find yourself not sitting up straight, 
this may be an indication that you need some elder campaign. It fights fatigue that uh, results from sitting too long. So it's a really relatively good herb to support your health. Eucalyptus, I absolutely love these trees when I was in California. Um, I just think they're amazing. Now I found out that um, the eucalyptus will actually suck up the fluid, making the ground very, very dry. So it's great for like swampy areas because it's gonna take up all that fluid and it does the same thing in your body. It's a very drying remedy that if you have a lot of liquid going on in your body, uh, congestion of respiratory tract mucus, membranes and respiratory depression, which is cold, damp condition. Um, this can also be used if a woman or uh, is not hot, damp, but if you've got clammy skin, uh, clammy feet, eucalyptus can help with that. Um, you can inhale it and uh, you can put it in, so it's a eucalyptus essential oil, can be put in a bowl of boiling water and put a few drops in it and then uh, cover your head with a towel and breathe in the steam um, that is infused with eucalyptus. And this can help. It, it's the way to get eucalyptus into the respiratory system. So this is great for bronchitis, cough, sinusitis, asthma, COPD, and respiratory infections. Now you can uh, spray it. Uh, you can put it in a little bottle and spray it and then breathe it in that way. Um, you know, you mix it with water and create a, a spray with it. Uh, you can diffuse it in, um, you know, in an electric diffuser. So that's a really wonderful herb and essential oil. Now, garlic. When garlic is crushed under the action of an enzyme, so in other words, you crush it, an enzyme is released called alanase, and alanin is converted to allicin through this enzyme. And allicin is highly antimicrobial, so it's not just bacterial, it's not just viral, it's a lot of things, in fact, antiparasitical. So it, um, when ingested, allicin is excreted through the lungs, making one of the most useful remedies for the respiratory infections. In fact, it actually is excreted through the skin. So not just the breath. Um, you can smell garlic through the skin. And one way of attesting to this is take a clove of garlic, um, cut it in half and rub the cut half on the bottom of your feet and you'll taste it. That's how it just moves through the mucous membranes. So it's warming and drying. Oh, horseradish, oh my goodness. I've grown this, it, it, it's very pretty flower, but the rhizomes that come off of the plant are what you cut and um, so I cut all the way around my plant and I keep the deep root so that it grows again next year. But any one of those cuttings, if you leave any little part, it'll grow another plant. So <laughs> once you have horseradish, you're pretty much assured to have horseradish in your garden. So <laughs> it's warming, drying remedy with strong expectorant action. So it decongests the sinuses. So it's, it's spicy. Um, and the emotional indications from Dorothy Hall is for stodgy people with a narrow, rigid code of behavior that leads to emotional deprivation. So they have a grim philosophy. Life wasn't meant to be easy. You know, just suck it up. And, uh, you know, I, I never have good luck. Nothing good happens to me, that type of person. 
So no raw emotions are food, no self-indulgent behavior. So in other words, they're not going to treat themselves. They're not going to say, I'm going to go take a nice warm bath or I'm going to do this for myself. They're the opposite. <laughs> now we have lobelia. Now I love lobelia. It um, is one of my favorite herbs. I uh, actually love growing it. Uh, this is the type that is used medicinally uh, it has the most lobeline is um, akin to the tobacco plant and so uh, lobelia can be used for people who are trying to uh, decrease uh, smoking or eliminate it it can be taken as a capsule it can be taken as a liquid and I think I use it as a liquid far more than I recommend it as a capsule. So it's a powerful antispasmodic that can ease asthma attacks, whooping cough, and fatigued lungs from constant coughing. It also acts as a mild expectorant. So uh, I have had people who have had asthma and gotten off of asthma. Uh, and one of the things that they used was lobelia. And you can sip on it. Uh, you put a few drops in some warm water and sip on it. You can uh, rub it on your chest. Uh, I had a gal who, uh, maybe she was 12, and she just kept throwing up, throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. And the interesting thing about lobelia is if you take too much, it makes you throw up because maybe there's congested mucus all the way into the digestive system. And the only way to get rid of that is throwing up. So um, if you take enough of it, you can cause that to, to happen. So I had um, a little 12 year old in the office and carrying this bag because the poor thing was, she couldn't stop throwing up. And she was to the point where she was dry heaving. And so she was leaning over the toilet and I drizzled a couple of drops of lobelia on the back of her neck and rubbed it in. And lo and behold, instantly, she picked her head up and she said, what did you do? I feel so much better. I don't feel like I have to throw up anymore. And then I asked her mom if it was okay if she sipped on some. And so she sat in the reception room, uh, sipping on a little glass of water that I put a couple of drops of lobelia in. And her coloring came back within a few minutes and it was done. And she had been struggling with this for over two hours. So, you know, you can get really depleted. And lobelia is one of those things that go in my first aid kit because you actually um, never know when you're gonna need um, some liquid lobelia. So a love lies bleeding out <laughs> this plant. It says it all. Look at this droopy stuff here. You know, now some people think that's beautiful, but I just think it's laughable. Anyway, love lies bleeding. It's so sad. Um, flower is a flower essence that helps people who are suffering intensely due to feeling alone and they're suffering. Now, even though I think this is laughable, I don't think the situation is laughable. Goodness. Uh, it helps a person find meaning in their suffering and to recognize that they are not alone in their suffering. Um, every Tuesday I do a half hour class and this month I'm concentrating on gratitude. And this coming Tuesday, I'm dedicating the class to gratitude to unfortunate circumstances. So there are many people that have gone through a horrific experience to discover their strength, that that situation was the cornerstone for who they are now. And so there, you know, yes, you can look at it and you can wallow in it, but you can also look at it as what kind of gift is this and what do I need to learn from it? So it helps a person move past personal pain to create more compassion and awareness. 
that is understanding the pain of others. Now, so it's not only understanding and recognizing what do I need to learn from this, but to understand that other people are going through pain and you shouldn't just tell them to suck it up or whatever. Mullen, I had the pleasure of growing a very small mullen plant. It was like this size, but I every day I daily took off three, sometimes there was only two flowers and I finally got enough to make an ear oil with it uh, along with St. John's wort and garlic. And so that's in my first aid kit. So one of the best remedies for dry cough, dry lungs and wheezing is mullen. It helps with bronchitis, asthma, pleurisy, pneumonia, croup, emphysema, tuberculosis. Now mullen is a safe plant uh, that you can give children. And if they're to the point where they can't swallow capsules, you can mix it up in uh, applesauce and give it to a child that way. Um, so for adults, they would want to take six capsules daily for at least six months when you're dealing with these long-term chronic conditions. And it helps one give inner strength. Look at this stalk, you know, sturdy, sturdy stalk. And the leaves are soft and pliable. In fact, um, a lot of campers will say that they go to look for the mullen plant to go to the bathroom. <laughs> they take a few of these leaves with them and use it as toilet paper. So, you know, it has a lot of uses when it's dried out. It can be a great torch. So campers love mullen. Now pine. Pine is warming. It's a drying expectorant. Uh, old thick mucus that needs to be drawn up and out, hard thick green mucus. Um, you can use the pine essential oil. Um, you can make a tea in the springtime. Uh, little sprouts will come from this and you clip those off and make a tea out of it. Or you can clip those off if you have a lot of them and make uh, an infusion with it and then later on you can make a uh, cough syrup with it. Um, you can add black cherry. Uh, there's other things that um, some people will use zinc and slippery elm and those type of things to make your own cough syrup. So chronic bronchitis and deep-seated lung affections with green mucus, uh, the essential oil, to clear congestion and infection in the lungs. Now, pine is very antiseptic, and so you can use it to clean things, and so it gets rid of a lot of microbes. Uh, very good to use as a cleaning agent. Uh, I love the smell of it, and um, I use it with lemon. In fact, pine salt. That's where it derived uh, its name is from. Pine, of course, you won't find any healthy stuff in pine salt. So flower essence is to release toxic shame and self-forgiveness. So if pine is used in a flower essence. That's what it's used for. Now, uh, plantain is a cooling and drying remedy that draws out fluid. It can be helpful for bronchitis with dry cough, cleaning the lungs after quitting smoking, um, pulls water out of the lungs in pneumonia, draws stuck phlegm out of the lungs, especially in combination with gumweed, and it helps with fibrosis in the lungs, like um, when you have emphysema. This is a wonderful weed. Um, I let it grow throughout my lawn. Um, it is of the family of plantain, but it's also called broadleaf. And you can take a clean leaf and chew it up and put it on a mosquito bite, and it will stop the itch and pull out any of the uh, uh, venom or toxin. Uh, it it's just a really, really great plant that can be used in a variety of ways. Now, thyme, I also grow this in my herb garden and love it. 
It's warming, drying with immune stimulating action. So it's effective for spasmodic cough associated with bronchitis, whooping cough, asthma, COPD, and emphysema. And use it with wild cherry and licorice, and you can make a great cough syrup. Um, you can use the essential oil. Now remember, you wanna get sweet thyme if you're dealing with children because um, regular thyme is just too harsh for children. And Nature Sunshine has the sweet thyme. Yerba Santa is a warming, stimulating phlegm from, and it clears phlegm from the, the um, chest. It opens the air passages and um, it is helpful for coughs, bronchitis, asthma, and um, as a flower essence, it helps people who feel smothered and constricted in the chest and emotions to breathe freely. And so breathing freely has been what this whole class is all about. Um, if I've offended you, you're a mask wearer, I'm sorry, but I think in the years that come to pass that we're going to find out that it it was another agenda. It was never about the virus. So <clears throat> now I'm going to open the screen up. And if anybody wants to uh, join in, <laughs> ask some questions, you can open your mic, um, ask the questions. And um, if you are viewing this through YouTube, be sure to like, comment, share subscribe. Um, I love hearing from you. And the way I help people is oftentimes in this crazy time, uh, I do a lot through email and through um, Zoom consultations. So I don't see any questions. So I hope that this has been a beneficial and that you've enjoyed it. If you would like the handouts for this class, uh, in other words, the slides that I shared with you, uh, send me an email, drmaryatbornforhealth.com, and I will uh, be happy to send you the PDF of it. And then um, you can view it again, share it with other people. And I hope that your day is um, wonderful and that you look at all the wonderful things around you. And um, uh, again, thank you for, for viewing.